We will always attract to us in our lives and conditions according to our thought. Things are but outer manifestations of inner mental concepts. Thought is not only power, it is also the form of all things. The conditions that we attract will correspond exactly to our mental pictures. It is quite necessary, then, that the successful businessman should keep his mind on thoughts of happiness, which should produce cheerfulness instead of depression. He should radiate joy and should be filled with faith, hope, and expectancy. These cheerful, hopeful attitudes of mind are indispensable to the one who really wants to do things in life. Put every negative thought out of your mind once and for all. Declare your freedom. Know no matter what others may say, think, or do, you are a success now, and nothing can hinder you from accomplishing your good. All the power of the universe with you, feel it, know it, and then act as though it were true. This mental attitude alone will draw people and things to you. Begin to blot out one by one, all false beliefs, all ideas that man is limited or poor or miserable. Use that wonderful power of will that God has given you. Refuse to think failure or to doubt your own power. See only what you wish to experience and look at nothing else. No matter how many times the old thoughts return, destroy it by knowing that it has no power over you. Look it squarely in the face and tell it to go. It does not belong to you, and you must know and stick to it that you are now free. Rise up in all the faith of one who knows what he is dealing with, and declare that you are one with infinite mind. Know you cannot get away from this mind, that wherever you may go, there, right beside you, waiting to be used, is all the power there is in the universe. When you realize this, you will know that in union with this, the only power, you are more than all else. You are more than anything that can ever happen to you. Always remember that spirit makes things out of itself. It manifests in the visible world by becoming the thing that it wills to become. In the world of the individual, the same process takes place. It is given to man to use creative power but with the using of this power comes the necessity of using it as it is made to be used. If God makes things out of His thought before they come into manifestation, then we must use the same method. You can only attract that which you first mentally become and feel yourself to be in reality without any doubting. A steady stream of consciousness going out into creative mind will attract a steady manifestation of conditions. A fluctuating stream of consciousness will attract the corresponding manifestation or condition in your life. We must be consistent in our attitude of mind, never wavering. James says, Ask in faith, nothing doubting, for he that doubteth is like a surge of the sea driven by the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. We are all immersed in an aura of our thinking. This aura is the direct result of all that we have ever said, thought, or done. It decides what is to take place in our life, it attracts what is like itself, and repels what is unlike itself. We are drawn towards those things that we mentally embody. Most of the inner processes of thought have been unconscious, but when we understand the law, all we have to do is to embody consciously what we wish and think of that only, and then we shall be drawn silently toward it. We have this law in our hands to do with as we will. We can draw what we want only as we let go of the old order and take up the new. And this we must do to the exclusion of all else. This is no weak man's job, but an undertaking for the strong, self-reliant soul, and the end is worth the effort. The person who can hold his thought one-pointed is the one who will obtain the best results. But this does not imply the necessity of strain or anything of strenuous nature. On the contrary, strain is just what we must avoid. When we know that there is but one power, we shall not struggle. 
we shall know, and in calmness we shall see only what we know must be the truth. This means a persistent, firm determination to think what we want to think, regardless of all outer evidence to the contrary. We look not to the seen, but the unseen. The king of Israel understood this when, looking upon the advancing hosts of the enemy, he said, We have no might against this great company, but our eyes are upon thee, upon the one power. Just imagine yourself surrounded by mind, so plastic, so receptive, that it receives the slightest impression of your thought. Whatever you think it takes up and executes for you, every thought is received and acted upon. Not some, but all thoughts. Whatever the pattern we provide, that will be our demonstration. If we cannot get over thinking that we are poor, then we will still remain poor. As soon as we become rich in our thought, then we will be rich in our expression. These are not mere words, but the deepest truth that has ever come to the human race. Hundreds of thousands of the most intelligent thinkers and the most spiritual people of our day are providing this truth. We are not dealing with illusions, but with realities. Pay no more attention to the one who ridicules these ideas than you would to the blowing of the wind. In the center of your soul, choose what you want to become, to accomplish, keep it to yourself. Every day in the silence of absolute conviction, know that it is now done. It is just as much done, as far as you are concerned, as it will be when you experience it in the outer. Imagine yourself to be what you want to be. See only that which you desire. Refuse even to think of the other. Stick to it, never doubt. Say many times a day, I am that thing. Realize what this means. It means that the great universal power of mind is that, and it cannot fail. Some people visualize everything that they think of, and many think that it is impossible to make a demonstration unless they possess the power to visualize. This is not the case. While a certain amount of vision is necessary, on the other hand, it must be remembered that we are dealing with a power that is like the soil of the ground, which will produce the plant when we plant the seed. It does not matter if we have never before seen a plant like the one that is to be made for us. Our thought is the seed, and mind is the soil. We are always planting and harvesting. All that we need to do is to plant only that which we want to harvest. This is not difficult to understand. We cannot think poverty and at the same time demonstrate plenty. If a person wants to visualize, let him do so, and if he sees himself in full possession of his desire and knows that he is receiving, he will make his demonstration. If, on the other hand, he does not visualize, then let him simply state what he wants and absolutely believe that he has it and the result will always be the same. Remember that you are always dealing with law and that is the only way that anything could come into existence. Don't argue it. That means that you have not as yet become convinced of the truth or you would not argue. Be convinced and rest in peace. What if at times we attract something that we do not want? What about all the things that we have already attracted into our lives? Must we still suffer until the last farthing be paid? Are we bound by karma? Yes, in a certain degree, we are bound by what we have done. It is impossible to set law in motion and not have it produce. What we sow, we must also reap. Of that there is no doubt. But here is something to think about. The Bible also says that if a man repents his sins, are blotted out, and remembered no more forever. Here we have two statements which at first seem not to agree. The first says that we must suffer from what we have done, and the second that under certain conditions we will not have to suffer. What are those conditions? A changed attitude towards the law. It means that we must stop thinking and acting in the wrong way. When we do this, we are taken out of the old order and established in the new. 
Someone will say, if that is true, what about the law of cause and effect? Is that broken? No, it is still this way. The law is not broken. It would still work out if we continued to use it in the wrong way. But when we reverse the cause that is, think and act in a different way, then we have changed the flow of the law. It is still the same law, but we have changed its flow, so that instead of limiting us and punishing us, it frees and blesses. It is still the law, but we have changed our attitude toward it. We might throw a ball at the window, and if nothing stopped it, it would break the glass. Here is the law in motion. But if someone catches the ball before it reaches the window, the glass will not be broken. The flow of law will be changed, that is all. So can we, no matter what has happened in the past, so transcend the old experience that it will no longer have any effect upon us? So if we have attracted something that is not best to keep, we will remember that we do not have to keep it. It was the best that we knew at the time, and so was good as far as it went, but now we know more and can do better. As law works without variation, so does the law of attraction work the same way. All that we have to do is drop the undesired thing from our thought, forgive ourselves, and start anew. We must never think of it again. Let go of it once and for all. Our various experiences will teach us more and more to try to mold all of our thoughts and desires so that they will be in line with the fundamental purpose of the great mind, the expression that which is perfect. To fear to make conscious use of the law would be to paralyze all efforts of progress. More and more, we will come to see that the great cosmic plan is being worked out and that all we have to do is lend ourselves to it in order that we may attain unto a real degree of life. As we do subject our thought to the greater purposes, we are correspondingly blessed because we are working more in line with the Father, who from the beginning knew the end. We should never lose sight of the fact that we are each given the individual right to use the law, and we cannot escape from using it. Let us then go forward with the belief that a greater power is working through us, that all law is a law of good, that we have planted our seed of thought in the mind of the Absolute, and that we can go our way rejoicing in the divine privilege of working with the Infinite.